Marconi's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Whiskey Neat, spirited conversations with interesting people. I am your host, Christopher Hart, and I am fresh off of an, an incredible weekend at Comic Palooza here in Houston. Uh, I had so, so much fun. It was so nice to get out. Uh, some people had masks. Some people had masks. Get it as face mask, Comic Palooza, you dress up. Never mind. Uh, it was an incredible time. I got to finally meet Katie Sackhoff in person. I met Giancarlo Esposito, Ron Perlman, Danny Trejo, and for some odd reason, Mark Paul Gosseler, the guy who played Zach Morris in Saved by the Bell, for all of you millennials out there. Uh, it was an incredible time. Comic Palooza was great. I, I, I cannot recommend it enough, and I cannot wait to go back next year. But let's get back to whiskey. So um, this week we sit down the week before uh, Mark Norman joins us. So check out next week, Mark Norman. Uh, and also Chris Catan is coming on next week. Uh, that'll be interesting. So uh, I sit down with uh, Randall Sullivan. Uh, many of you know who Randall is. Uh, he's the host of Bourbon Real Talk. Uh, he's DFW's leading bourbon real estate agent, and of course, he's my business partner and cohort for the Prideful Goat, uh, our spirits brand. So uh, I sit down with him finally after more than three years uh, on this show to talk about the Prideful Goat, upcoming projects, everything he's working on, and and uh, as I say often, a good time was had by all. Uh, let's get right into a couple of ad reads real quick. I do want to give a quick shout out to our own merchandise website, which I don't do enough. I wish I thought about it more. And that's whiskeymerch.com. Whiskeymerch.com. Yes, it's the greatest name. Yes, the UR was available. Yes, I bought it. Whiskeymerch.com. Uh, and then, of course, Whiskey Neat is brought to you in part by Legion to Bourbon, a first of its kind super premium bourbon that melds Kentucky distilling tradition with Japanese blending excellence. Legion is a perfectly balanced yet complex and layered whiskey with a bright, and I'm not saying smooth, unexpectedly long finish. Order a bottle in your area via drizzly.com today. I talk about it every every week. Uh, Legion is a, a solid drinker, a great introduction to the category. Uh, big, big, big fan, big fan. Uh, and of course, shout out to our friends over at Amroot. Uh, this makes me happy. Uh, I am extremely proud. Amroot has supported the show for a while now, and I love Amroot so much. It's been such a great partnership. It's been o almost two years now. Uh, and this year, Amroot became the world's fourth trending world single malt brand just after Nika, Suntory, and Cavalon. Amroot would like to thank all of our listeners across the world for being a part of that growth, uh, but especially listeners of our show. Uh, Amroot is is uh, very near and dear to my heart. Hopefully, we'll see another barrel selection with them soon. Um, in the meantime, uh, you guys know our official sponsor, Balconies. Can't go wrong with them. I want to let you guys know that we just released, by the time this airs, um, we did a couple of single malts last year that were ex-Rumble casks, but in every single total wine in the Houston metropolitan area, we released a couple cases at each of our Madeira finished single malt. All first fill, the, the liquid is darker than death, darker than my soul, uh, and it is absolutely tremendous. You can get it at Total Wine, check it out. Uh, but without further ado, please welcome this week's guests, my friend, my good friend, known him for a long time, completely reasonable, he wears a wig. His name is Randall Sullivan. Cheers. Randall, buddy. What's up, man? You're finally on the show. Yes. I am so excited to be here. Uh, I realized I, I, yesterday, I was like, Randall's in town. Uh, why don't we sit down? He's never been on the show. Let's talk about the Prideful Goat. Let's talk about everything that's happening. Uh, and, and how has this not happened up to this point? 
I don't know. I I mean, I'm so jealous of Todd. It's like Todd is on every, every other episode, episode yeah. right? And then and then when you have real big guests on, he travels with you and gets to hang out with the celebs. And I'm like, man, how do I get on Todd's level? Um, and I feel like this is step one. So I'm coming for you, Todd, if you're listening to this. Yeah, Todd Todd couldn't make it today because he broke another bone. Oh, my gosh. Uh, no, he didn't. But that I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, so for those who don't know, uh, Randall Sullivan is my partner in crime for uh, the Prideful Goat. Uh, we are in it together with Carlos de Aldeco Bueno. Uh, and also, you are the host of your own show called Bourbon Real Talk. That is true. I, I do have a show, Bourbon Real Talk. The I always try to put uh, things into perspective. Uh, so, like, if you're looking for a show to watch that's educational and you're getting into the hobby, mm -hmm. Bourbon Real Talk. I that that is my lane. Uh, it took me a while to find my lane. So if you go if you go far enough back into my episodes, you'll be very confused. You're like this guy's all over the place. Um, but eventually, I I found a lane for myself, and I am very passionate about helping to get people connected to spirits, uh, specifically bourbon. And you know, there's kind of a backstory that I tell on all of my my episodes as to why um, I I lost my brother to suicide. And, um, you know, I realized there's people all around that are, they feel alone and disconnected. And I saw so much connectedness inside the whiskey community. And I saw such a passion for people to get involved in the whiskey community that I thought, hey, what if I, what if I help these people learn all the stuff that I've spent hundreds, you know, thousands of hours learning sure, sure. Uh, in a very, you know, short period of time. Maybe if I can get people connected to bourbon, the bourbon will connect them to others and, and we can help everybody feel like a community. Yeah, it's a very noble thing. Uh, and you've actually done quite one of my favorite things. <clears throat> you covered the neck pour debate. I did. And you covered it. You did what I didn't do. And what I, what I did was have a conversation with the bourbon junkies and Matt from ADHD Whiskey, and we sat there and had a candid conversation. No pre-planning, no notes were taken. It was just, let's discuss this and argue like idiots. You actually went out of your way to fully plan an episode, and you, you mentioned to me that the reason why you did that episode was because of how poorly planned my episode was. That's not what I said. <laughs> what I said was I was listening to... You know, because obviously, I res everybody that was part of that episode, I respect all of them immensely Except for their Matt, but yeah. for their position in, in in the whiskey community. And I was listening to everybody talk, and I was like, "Y'all aren't even talking about the same thing." And I I I started screaming at the screen, and then I was like, "Oh, you got to do something, right? Um, let's let's make sure that everybody that's talking about this is on the same page." And so. Uh, did I think that it was poorly planned? No. Um, and a lot of the content that I got or the direction that I went in my piece was because of what I heard in that. So uh, thank you to everybody. Well, it was single-handedly the best thing you've ever done. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate and not, that. Not just because I feel great. I, it's not because I feel so passionate about the topic, but because in the bourbon Facebook world, the sense of uh, superiority or feelings on certain subjects like whether or not bourbon can be made outside of Kentucky a lot of it is just so stupid and pointless and and when you try to educate someone online people tend to plant their feet firmly in a belief irrespective of the facts mm -hmm. and then it becomes a personal fight to defend their belief versus educating and learning something and you address both sides of the argument you address the the counterpoints and then the counterpoints to those counterpoints it is the most thoroughly thought out video i have ever seen covering a single topic in the bourbon world truly one of the best things i've ever watched i cannot thank you enough and that means a lot coming from you uh i don't know why because it's not like this show is anything other than two idiots talking, right? Like, <laughs> like it's just a con like I have Mark Norman coming. Hey, sometimes it's three idiots talking, <laughs> like right now. Brandon off camera. Uh, I have Mark Norman coming on this week. Guarantee he's gonna fart and burp in the episode. 
probably close to each other at the same time. Like, it's not like, I, I don't like, uh, Julian asked me about this. So for those who don't know Julian, Julian's the head distiller at Gulf Coast Distillers. He asked me, like, why don't you do videos like Randall? I said, well, Randall's videos are aimed at a certain audience, just like Fred Minnick's videos are aimed at a certain mm-hmm. audience. I don't have it in me to do, uh, like, I don't feel like my lane is the top 10 bottles of bourbon for Father's Day. Right. I'd rather have just a casual conversation, while we, like we do in real life. Sure, like We have yeah. a few drinks. Uh, and your videos, I think, are so well produced and have only gotten better as time has gone on uh, that, you know, uh, I think you've really found your stride. I, I hope so. Um, I've I've learned to trust my instinct that if a topic seems interesting to me, that they're recently covered the Jack Daniels topic as well. I did uh, do that as well. Um, so did so did Fred. About the same time, uh, he came out with a piece. And um, what was this called? I actually don't remember. I, I'm on his email list, so I and I, and I will admit, and I and I apologize to all of the other whiskey tubers out there. I don't watch anybody else's content because I'm super concerned about plagiarism and coming across as somebody that's trying to steal someone else's ideas that that brought them success. And so I typically won't watch a piece until I've already covered the subject. Um, And then, you know, I'm, I'm super into details and, and education. And sometimes the show formats are not as much about that. There's a little bit more silliness and antics and whatnot. And so you just got to find what you like. But I, I like your show because I'm so interested in whiskey and little bits of information come out on accident just because you are so up on what's 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 going on in the whiskey world. And sometimes you're just explaining to a celebrity something, right? And I'm like, ah, oh, crap, I didn't know that. And then I go out and I do research. But I find your show super entertaining. And so that that's why I don't necessarily watch your show because of the whiskey content. I watch it because it's entertaining for oh. me. Thanks. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was talking to Alex Coffin, and he said, like, your, your show's not really a whiskey show. I'm like, no, it, it is a whiskey show. It's just there's different types of shows aimed at different types of audiences. And, like, I get requests for brands to come on here, and we're not doing them anymore. We're not doing brand interviews anymore because – now, I did talk to Nicole Austin because of the whole bourbon thing. Right. Uh, that was a, an exception to the rule, and it was a relative uh, – a relevant – conversation beyond just a brand sales pitch yeah i don't think that was that was that was brand specific um although i am super curious uh she she said in that interview that the uh that the rules were changed um, no, she's wrong i i knew she was i just wanted to confirm <laughs> yeah she's wrong about two points so one of the things she mentioned was uh that that other states have a reciprocity obligation to honor uh, Tennessee whiskey's rules. Right. That's not true. Uh, You can, uh, uh, the the states, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to get better. Uh, Like for instance, like with gun laws, our states reciproc, those are based state by state. Sure. Uh, There is no, like you could take a whiskey distilled in Tennessee, Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, put it in American, like a used barrel, and then sell it in a different state as Tennessee whiskey because it technically is. Mm-hmm. It's a ter- it's a territorial definition, right? But the idea that it has to comply with every single state law when it's not a federal law is not is not true. Just like she mentioned that finishes are now being treated the same. They're still they're class they're, 641. They're still class 641, yeah, yeah. correct. So, uh, and for those who don't know what we're talking about, uh, if you take a bourbon and you put it into a, a cognac barrel and you finish it for six months in a cognac barrel, uh, you can describe it on the front label as Kentucky straight bourbon finished in a cognac barrel, but it's not technically bourbon anymore. What you're saying is, is you took bourbon and you made it not bourbon. Right. That's what you're really ultimately saying. Uh, this idea that once something is bourbon, it can't be unbourbon is, is stupid true, and makes yeah. no sense. So um, she was wrong on that. But that being said, that that led to you doing a Jack Daniels video on the subject. That turned out to be, uh, in spoiler alert, Jack Daniels qualifies as bourbon. Yeah. Uh, but I've beat that to death, so we can we can skip on past that. Yeah. Uh, why are you here today? 
I am here because we are working on the next large release of, of the Prideful of Goat. Of the Prideful Goat. That's right. So, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Randall and I are business partners uh, for the Prideful Goat. Someone say whiskey, his group, uh, as well as people, you know, people I know from the Houston Bourbon Society were invited to help pick the 15-year goat. Now we have... Uh, affectionately what's been known as the baby goat the baby goat uh, six year old rye whiskey that's coming out that's going to be about half the price mm-hmm. $59.99 it'll be the cheapest cast strength MGP rye on the market yep uh, we uh, and we openly address it right on the on the label clear as day that, that this is from a well known Indiana distillery that uh, is not new to the market uh, we all everyone here that's fans of whiskey is, has heard of MGP rye but these are hand-picked barrels you and I tasted through 23 today? Uh, some, somewhere in that vicinity. About yeah. 23 barrels to find what would be blended and what would be single barrels. Right. Um, and we're doing another 30 tomorrow. Yes. Maybe 40. We'll see. We'll see. If we if we can last that long. Yeah. So it's For quite- those of you that have never tried... 20 barrels of whiskey in 23 in one sitting my mouth is dry you're 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 you get what they call palate fatigue and it starts to become difficult to distinguish the nuance of flavor between you know barrels that are all effectively the same thing there's just nuance that's caused by you know aging conditions and the variance in the wood that went into the barrels and things like that what's and, cr- what's crazy is we we bought 100 barrels they were all distilled on the same day filled the same day same type of barrels stored in the same part of the warehouse mm-hmm. and they are all Dif- so different yeah I, it's in it, i i wonder whether or not the average person would find them as different as we do yeah I think um, so. but it's it's so interesting because there was a bubblegum note that would stick out on some that it legit <laughs> tasted like bubblegum and there were a handful that had a more classic pine note. There's a lot of rye whiskeys that I'll get a pine needle note on. Um, there were some that tasted almost like toasted barrel finish because there was so much caramelized wood sugar flavor and smokiness and things. And then, you know, and everything in between. Some were very vanilla and caramel forward. And um, But I, I think that we got uh, some... Some, some decent barrels. Some decent barrels. There's one that was had a ton of like orange oil flavor to that it. That one, yeah. yeah. So, so for those who, and this is something I love to openly address. I am I, I any bourbon uh, lore romance bullshit. I'm gonna call it out. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> we had a crew of great people from Barry Laminex show, Barry on Deck, mm-hmm. come out in last weekend and taste through five barrels and pick their favorite. It was unanimous. Okay. Yeah. So these And are that's people, not uncommon. These these people have no experience. Right. And we I literally had to teach them how to drink. And it, it, this idea of these mega palates, these people who are super great at yeah, there are people who can tell or pick up on certain notes that you can't. But the overall picture, it's either beautiful or it's not beautiful. Right. And anyone can tell. Mm-hmm. There, there's an innate difference in us as humans where, like, we know that beauty is measurable, right? Like, beauty is not just in the eye of the beholder. Objective beauty is based on math, right? Mm-hmm. Ratios, symmetry. These are things you can tell even as a child is good or bad just like music hearing someone sing my five-year-old tells me all the time i'm the worst singer she knows <laughs> and i and on top of it being the meanest thing she says to me it she's not classically trained mm-hmm. she doesn't have an ear that can pick apart octaves she's a five-year-old that can tell daddy needs to work on <laughs> on his singing uh so it, it's one of those things that we we anyone can do it and when you get a small handful of people together uh you get one of two scenarios. Either it's unanimous, or as you mentioned earlier, which is absolutely true, it's usually down to two. Yeah. Uh, one that's a people pleaser and one that's a wild card. Mm-hmm. I like the wild card. I always pick the wild card. I love the wild card. It's always fun. Robusto was a wild card that was very controversial. Uh, it's something that happens all the time. Uh, but yeah, so we actually tasted through 23 samples. Here is one of those samples. And this might be... 
the orange oil one. Mm -mm. That was a split decision one, I think. This one? Yeah. So that that's an interesting... There's bubble gum on that, for yeah, sure. Yeah, interesting tidbit. We learned real quick, uh, Julian and I, that if it if it had the bubble gum note, Chris was going to like it. Chris likes the bubble gum note. Um, and then of the 23 that we tried and the handful that we decided to put into... Um, the, the, or potentially put into the barrel uh, single barrel program. What I found interesting is there was only one split decision out of the twenty three that we tried. Um, the one towards the end that I left up to y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. Then there were two. There were two where two of us wanted it and the other one didn't. <laughs> um, and. That's not uncommon. I mean, you'll, common, you'll no. find when you do big tastings where there's 20 different people. Yeah, there'll be five outliers, but still you'll get 15 people that pick the same one or the same one or two. You know what I'm saying? Sure, sure. And it's like you said, I mean, you, you don't have to be an expert to know what tastes good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are some objective uh, differences uh, and some things are a preference to others and not a preference to you, sure. But it's really not that hard to, to tell good whiskey from bad whiskey. Um, we've actually never discussed the Prideful Goat together on camera, I don't mm -mm. think. So you – you I know recently you did a, something with Cal California? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's a I, – I believe it's the oldest bar west of the Mississippi. Um, so I know that uh, – uh, Lafitte's blacksmith shop is older, but it's Elixir. Yeah, that's in San Francisco, and there's a local whiskey club there that they do tastings there, and um, so they reached out to me and said, "How did they hear about it? It's not the goat's not in California. No, we it, it wasn't it wasn't distributed there, but I believe, but it will be. It will be. Um, we got ten bre breaking news. Ten state, uh, ten new states distribution for the goat." And the baby goat is a hundred barrels. A dozen or so will be private barrel program. The rest will be sold as a batch one. And California is one of the states. Sorry, finish your story. No worries. So um, I, I do run a, a Facebook based whiskey club called Someone Say Whiskey. Uh, we are not local to North Texas, although 80, 85% of our membership is in the North Texas region. Questionable. Uh, questionable. Uh, but. Uh, well, I mean, you can see what states, although you can't see whether or not there's people in Texas that are outside of the North Texas region when you look at the statistics. Yeah. But uh, because we have members all over, one of the members that was from that area that is, I think he might be an admin of the local whiskey club, reached out to me and said, hey, I manage these tastings. I think it'd be really cool to expose the brand to our club members. You know, could could you set aside a couple of bottles and, and we do it? a zoom tasting and you come on and kind of taste us through it and so we what, what were some of the i'm sure they asked you all the questions possible uh they were just actually super curious about you know the process of like how do you how do you even make your own whiskey right and and one of the shocking things that honestly i learned by watching you with gregarious grump is that you don't have to have a dsp yourself yeah you can own intellectual property and partner with somebody that has a DSP. Yeah, you know what that method is called? I don't. The Van Winkle method. Oh, there you go. <laughs> they, they, the Van Winkles pioneered this. So in 1999, uh, the Van Winkle family, Julian Van Winkle and the crew, uh, I think his son's name is Preston, they got into a joint venture agreement with, with Buffalo Trace. They used to be what is known as rectifiers, where they had their own DSP, but they were just sourcing whiskey. They got rid of their DSP and partnered with Buffalo Trace, lent them the intellectual property, and everything funnels downstream and then right back upstream. So, hey, I'm the Van Winkles. I'm giving Buffalo Trace permission. And maybe there's also a clause in there where the Van Winkles have a final say-so on what goes in the bottle, right? Mm -hmm. If you're going to put our name on it, we want a final say-so or some input as to the batch that goes in there. Buffalo Trace distills the whiskey, they bottle the whiskey, they sell the whiskey, they send it to the distributor, distributor sends it to the retail store, retail store pays the distributor, distributor pays Buffalo, Buffalo then pays a royalty to them. Mm -hmm. And that is how you can own a brand, 
without really owning a brand. Right. You stay out of the three tier system. Right. Uh, it's. I think it's more of in the technical space of the law, not necessarily in the spirit of the law. Sure. Uh, but yes. Yeah, so I own Gregarious's intellectual property, and I decide what projects we move forward with. Uh, and I say I. It's not I. It's the company Gammon. Gammon Spirits Group. Uh, owns the intellectual property, doesn't have a DSP light. I'm, I'm not in the three-tier system. It's it's all, uh, and I do that specifically so I can maintain the Whiskey Social. Sure, sure. Uh, I can't run the Whiskey Social and be in a tier of the three-tier system because we take payment from distributors and from suppliers. Right. As well as liquor stores. Yeah, and then there were a ton of questions that they ask about, you know, how do you find liquid and decide what you're going to buy? And, you know, that... That's something that the average consumer just doesn't think about, right? Because whiskey doesn't necessarily get sold by the person that the the company that made it. The producer often has sold barrels years ago <clears throat> to somebody who operates as a broker. Uh, sometimes the producer still has the barrels and they contact a broker to sell the barrels. Sometimes they do it. Uh, to maintain some level of anonymity so that the whole world's market doesn't find out that they're selling their whiskey to somebody else. Sometimes um, there's other business reasons why they do it. And then you, it's almost like I'm a real estate agent, right? And right now, if you're looking for a house and one comes on the market, you better make a decision sometime within the next two minutes or somebody else will, right? Sure. And that can be kind of fascinating to the whiskey enthusiast to know that when you do find out about whiskey that's available, often you don't have very much time to make that decision. And sometimes they want you to make the decision without even tasting it. Yeah. Right? And and or you sign a contract committing to buy it, uh, but you have an option to back out after you've tasted it. Um, negotiating shipping and you, you know all of those things are are behind the curtain things that you know they were very curious about and we talked a lot about um, you know just the the Herculean effort that it took to make this happen right yeah it's interesting I mean there's there's this idea that um, that you fall into it which does kind of happen right they say that um, Success is where opportunity and preparation meet or right. something. Like, we didn't plan to do this. No, it, it evolved into this. And then we were just we, doing something fun. Once we knew what we were going to do, it, <clears throat> we ran with it hardcore. Right. Um, and now, uh, as I mentioned, 10 new states. So Colorado, Wisconsin, Wyoming, California, Louisiana, Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi, and either Arizona or New Mexico. Mm. I always forget, but those are basically the same states. Yeah, okay, so. fair. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and I will say that I, I did, uh, it for, in the interest of full disclosure, uh -oh. I, I have had very little uh, drive time with regard to direction and control, especially of like label design, oh. working on the back end. And so I'd just like to say publicly, thank you to you, Mr. Christopher Hart, because <laughs> you have worked uh, very hard on all of this. And I appreciate all your effort and the great uh, result that it's creating. Well, so. we, to be clear, um, I, I, I get enough credit for a lot of things. And I think, um, I think some people may be tired of that at times. Uh, I, we're in this together. We're doing it together. Uh, but I live in Houston, the distilleries here in Houston. So it is a bit easier for me to knock some of this stuff out. Um, but, you know, we still, you know what's happening at, at sure. every pass. I mean, you came down. Uh, we had an opportunity a couple of months ago. Was it a couple of months already? I think it might even have been longer than that. We had access <laughs> to 10-year-old liquid. 10 to 14 year old 10 to 14 year old liquid. Kentucky straight bourbon well that's what we were told uh, from from a legacy distillery turns out once in a in a lifetime opportunity yeah, once in a once in a lifetime too good to be true opportunity it did it it was um yeah yeah the broker lied so it was corn whiskey not bourbon uh they as they say in the uh, there's an old saying uh it's been around a long time my mother used to say it um, uh, they fucked us. So, <laughs> so uh, all they, the contracts said yeah. that it was Kentucky straight yeah. bourbon. 
Uh, the escrow agreement said Kentucky Straight Bourbon. Money in the bank. Shorty, what you think? Like, was, it was done, done, there done. There was a lot of money in the I bank. I was crip walking. All right. Like, I thought we had the mother load. Yeah. I mean, couldn't nobody tell me nothing. I was so excited. Right? So excited. Turns out they lied. They lied. Uh, yeah, so it was not uh, bourbon, it was corn whiskey, but I will tell you this. So there's a lot of debate, and I'm going to be very careful how I say this, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of debate over whether or not the original Prideful Goat was one legacy distiller or a different legacy distiller. And we know without a doubt... Which one it is. Which one it is. And most of you are wrong. And uh, this other liquid from this other legacy distiller... We tasted alongside a confirmed released product that they had, Mm -hmm. and they tasted the same. Mm -hmm. And neither one of those two things, which we knew came from one distillery, tasted like the original Prideful Goat. No. No, it didn't. Yeah, so it was very clear that the Prideful Goat was not from... If we don't say which distillery it actually is, can we say... The two distilleries most people speculate it is? We could say what it's not. Because the NDP well, s- says we can't say what it is. I think it'd be more fun to tell the story if we don't tell them what it's not. Right? So every, every, can we can we even say the name if we don't no, indicate what it is? I wouldn't say Okay. It. All right. Well, then I'll, I'll say this. Um, so, so, it's, it's not Beam. It's definitely not Beam. And that is what most people think it is. Correct. Now, I had a super interesting experience. Yeah. And that was because uh, the Prival Goat, uh, batch one and two, were 15-year Kentucky straight bourbon. Yep. Most people speculate that it was Beam. Um, the number of people in the world that had access to uh, the Prival Goat and a single barrel of Beam 15-year juice, probably pretty low, right? Maybe only me. And the way that I got access to it was uh, Beam 15 year was a blending component in the Discovery series. From Bardstown. From Bardstown. And a friend of mine, Colby Howard, who was part of their tasting competition. Shout out to Colby. Shout out to Colby. uh, He has been sent samples to help them blend their future releases. So he had a 15 year Beam that he brought over to the house and he let me taste them side by side. And? Um, I will say that they were sh- sh- closer than I anticipated they would be. Sure. Okay. Uh, Enough but to make you question? It, it did make me question for a split second. I think I even called you. Um, I think I remember this. Yeah. And uh, But if you finish the glass and you let them both sit there and dry and you smelled them, that beam nuttiness came out strong. And th- that for, from the goat or from, from the, the beam, yeah. yeah. And the goat doesn't have a, a peanut component. No, I uh, see. I, I know there's some speculation of the cherry component, but there is no peanut component in the, in yeah. the goat. And that's that's to me is a dead giveaway. But that being said, I I get a peanut component component from anything bottom shelf. Do you? Yeah, if you go Evan Williams, uh, anything from Heaven Hill or otherwise, like I do get from a bottom shelf. I get it on ja- on, on Jack Daniels Black Label. I get it on something shitty. Yeah. Too. Well, and I don't I don't necessarily hate the peanut flavor, but it needs to be well integrated with something else. Sure. Um, but the I will admit that the 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 peanuttier a, a whiskey is the less the less likely it is that I'm gonna like it. Yeah. yeah. Well, long story short, sorry to bore you guys. We. Uh, the goat's coming. Uh, it'll turn six years old in October, uh, and we'll release it then into ten new states, a uh, hundred barrels worth, mm-hmm. and uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah. We'll be working on the next project soon. We're looking for liquid. Um, you know, we've got gregarious cognac. I should have brought that cognac for you. What did you bring with you today? Um, so I went to Tennessee. I guess two weeks ago, and we I did some interviews while I was there, and we were eating at this restaurant. And I asked, you know, what what whiskeys do you have? And they said, oh, we've got something that's local. And I don't mind drinking a bad whiskey if it's 
new to me. Uh, I like new experiences. And so I always roll the dice. I said, well, let me try that. And it was this leaper's fork. And so uh, they said, oh, it's a bottled and bond. I said, oh, bottled and bond. I mean, that's the uh, that's a green beret of whiskey, right? Um, that's what Bernie Lubbers calls it. And so I got myself a glass. Here, I'll let you pour yourself. Yeah. I got myself a glass and it surprised me. It, it doesn't have any of the you know, the the Dickel um, B vitamin, you know, Flintstone vitamin note that a lot of people get. And it's got a ton of, of cinnamon flavor on it. And I'm a pretty big fan of uh, cinnamon in my whiskey. And so we went to the distillery the next day and did a, did a little uh, walking around and checked the place out. And I really enjoyed it. So I brought it's it. It's got uh, a dusty quality to it. There's okay. A, there's a limestone mineral note that uh, is definitely there. I don't know if I love it, but uh, it is surprisingly decent and a lot better than a lot of Texas whiskey. Yeah, and it is it is a pot still whiskey, um, and so and hey, we've talked about this earlier. It's today. a little bit a little bit oilier. So I think, <clears throat> and I don't think I've said this on the record. So here we go. I think that there's all this romance behind Scottish whiskey and Scotch, and that. Everyone in America in the craft distillery scene, when they wanted to create a whiskey, they thought of a pot still. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like it imparts too much flavor in the raw distillate when most of their major producers, Buffalo Trace, Maker's Mark, um, Heaven Hill, they all utilize column still made bourbon. And why are we trying to mimic scotch for an American palate? We should be mimicking Kentucky distillers and using full-blown column stills. Well, and Jack I, Daniels, column still. Yep. So what? What? what's uh, Four Roses, column still? Everything's column still that's large except for Woodford, and that's questionable. They blend column still with their pot still. Yep, Old Forester. And they will not disclose how much is pot still and how much is column still. KBD has uh, pot still uh, product. Um, and KBD sucks. Uh, well, some people, I personally like it, but... Um, Be honest, it's okay. No, no, I, I, I like Willet pot still. Um, I, I sent out a ton of blind samples. Um, a few years ago, whenever all the bourbon nerds were jumping on the new people, they're like, look at this bottle I found. And people buy that typically because of the bottle shape. And then they go and post it in a whiskey club. And then all the um, the the old dogs um, hop on and tell them old that the, the best thing they can do is end their own life. Because if they like that whiskey, they don't deserve to live and all that stuff. And so I got frustrated with that. And I said, you know what? I, I'm going to send out some blind sample packs. And I sent out a bunch of blind sample packs. And Willet Pot still finished in the middle every time. Um, it's not terrible when people don't know what they're drinking. But that having been said, all the big guys are column. So why? Why? Th then the question becomes, why is amazing scotch made on a, a, a pot still and amazing bourbon made on a column still? And what people, I think, fail to realize is that and, I'm, and please don't try to kill me on this, but barley does not impart as much flavor um, I also think at, as that. corn and rye do to the distillate. Barley does impart a flavor. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's not as intense as corn and barley. So you might need a pot still distillation process for barley to retain as much flavor um, so that you can taste that grain. But because corn and rye are such a strong flavor in bourbon, you don't need to retain that much. And it's actually better. It tastes better to strip it out. And that's what the column still does. And that's what Jack Daniels filtration process does is it strips out those congeners and it, it, it makes it more approachable. And so from, from my research which uh, granted i'm not an expert but i've drank a lot of whiskey and i've interviewed a lot of whiskey makers i i think that it's a mistake to try to make bourbon on on a pot still unless you're going to do some filtration process to pull off some of those heavier oils yeah i think a lot of people just get very upset with you it's okay and i think they should be you're wrong no, i'm just kidding i agree with you completely i think uh column stills good scotch is made in a pot still good bourbon is made 
in a column. Yeah, and and there are certainly exceptions. Um, I'm I'm not saying that all bourbon made on a pot still or all American whiskey made on pot still is not good. I'm drinking one right now, and I'm I'm excited about. It. I like it. I love uh, I love Iron Roots. You know, love pot still, roots. Yep. pot still whiskeys. Um, and and there are other examples. That haven't been said. I think it's a lot easier to make something that people think tastes like an amazing bourbon on a column. Yeah. And for those of us who have tried distillate that was made on a column and a pot still from the same distillery with the same, you know, distillers and the same grain sources and all of that stuff, and you try them side by side, if you're a bourbon lover, you're probably going to like the column still distillate better. Of course. Uh, pivoting a bit, do you have an empty glass? Yeah. I brought a little something for you. Mm. <laughs> a little, uh, little known... Uh, it was seventeen dollars, so it's bottom shelf. Bottom shelf. Seven, the the price tag still on it says seventeen sixty for an old Weller antique one oh seven. So you know it's it's not very good. No. It's bottom shelf. It's only the best whiskey I've ever tasted. It's it's one it's up there for sure. And yeah. screw cap, no cork. Which I have a theory okay. that uh screw tops preserve dusty whiskeys better. Then oh, I'm sure than corks, and so I get a little bit more excited about like the wild turkey dusties that were screw tops that sometimes they're funky sizes like 1.14 liters and stuff like that. Sure, Um, because I I think they may retain a little bit more of that original flavor. Um, Man, I forgot how good this is. So the reason why I said that this was one of the best whiskeys I've ever had was because uh, last week I got to go to the Nashville House of Whiskey and they have what they believe to be the largest collection of open bottles in the world. It's over 3,000 open bottles. They're a nonprofit, not open to the public, um, but they are planning on expanding into other cities. They raise quite a bit of money for charities, uh, ten to twenty five thousand a month by doing tastings. And he got out a nineteen thirty nine uh Weller for me to try. And I love Dusty's because of the history and nostalgia. I feel like you're tasting a time and a place, you know. Uh, but often Dusty's have a characteristic that don't hit my palate exactly right. But this was just dusty enough to let you know that you were tasting something old that still had that beautiful bourbon flavor. Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree completely. It's the whole reason why we do the uh, birth year bottles for some guests. Right. Is it's this little moment in time, a little piece of history. I mean, we all go through struggles in our careers where you don't, uh, you wonder if you're going to make it, right? And all of these megastars, and I've had like one megastar on my show, there, there had to have been a time where they were just like, "Is am I ruining my life by being a celebrity or right. being an actor?" <laughs> uh, and and getting to, to you know, I, I and I actually got to I got to see Katie Sackoff this weekend at Comic Palooza uh, in person this time because I had her on the show, and we talked about it. She said she opened her birth year bottle with her fiance and family and her dad, and uh, they had this beautiful moment reminiscing about their childhood, and it's because. Some random idiot with a podcast sent her a bottle from her birth year. And, right. Uh, so yeah, I'm a big, a big believer in the time capsule thing. Sure. Uh, and uh, Jack makes fun of me a little bit because it's the same spiel every time. And then you know, because every episode it's like, oh, I got. It's you not to the guest. I know, and that's the thing is, like, to the guest, it's it's a, mo- you're really getting a peek on me getting to fanboy out over somebody. Well, yeah, I think that's uh, something that kind of bled over because I used to collect wine, and you know the concept of terroir, right? It's it's. You look like you collect hair gel. Oh, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Yeah, I I do have. My wife calls it the douche poof. The douche poof. Yeah, and she'll say the douche poof is a lot today, and my hair kind of does what it wants these days. Your, your uh, wife's actually become quite integrated into your podcast as well, right? Like she. She handles all the shipping, all the... Well, yeah. So my podcast, I I went to a Zig Ziglar lunch years and years ago. 
and um, boy, he, that's definitely in the nineties. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it was. Well, no, it might have been right around two thousand. Uh, yeah, somewhere, somewhere there, ninety nine, two thousand. Bracelets on. And yeah, yeah. No, pawns. I mean, I, I, I'm older than you, so I, no. I had a real <laughs> job, and the company like took us there for lunch to hear a motivational speech. Zig Ziglar, and he talked about um, that if you help enough people get what they want, they'll help you get what you want. And that always stuck with me. I don't like to personally ask people for things. And so my life philosophy has always just been to to give so much that eventually someone volunteers to help you with your goals, right? And I do that with my podcast. Um, and, and no offense to anybody that does Patreon or anything like that, but I just don't wanna ask people to donate to the podcast. And I don't want to have uh, show sponsors, right? Um, cause Why I, don't you want to have show sponsors? Well, because Say I can imagine that once you have a show sponsor and then you you want to do an interview, because I still want to do distillery interviews. I still oh, want to yeah. go, you know, that it there often there's something that the distillery is known for that I can do an educational piece on that's very on brand for me. And I don't want a, a, one of my show sponsors to be in like, hey, why are you... Why are you doing doing an episode on them? You know, we don't want to advertise on that show or whatever. I want to be independent. And so I make money off of my show through my merch. And my wife, who like it's it's hilarious. She she is this super quiet, semi shy, like and it turns out that she's a ninja when it comes to figuring stuff out like how to build a, a e-commerce site and how to work with um, you know producers of things to find things for a good price. And so my goal has always been find something that there's a need for and then produce it at a price that's cheaper than everybody else is producing that for. Prideful goat business. The prideful model. goat business model for okay. sure, right? And 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 then that way I don't, if, if somebody ever does give me the benefit of their money, they're receiving something greater in value in return, which means that all of the information that I'm giving them on my podcast is free. Yeah. And so uh, we, we do a lot of merch, but my wife is, she was like, if I had a title, what would it be? And I was like, oh, you'd be the, uh, I, I started with director level right away. She's gotta be a director, right? So I'm like, you'd probably be like the director of uh, product development and fulfillment. And she's like, oh, I like that. She might even have business cards made, I don't know. But that's what she does. So I'll come to her and I'll go, hey, I want the watchers of my show, I'm encouraging people to get together and drink. I want to have every product that they could possibly need to go to a bottle share, right? And so we're developing bags that you carry your bottles in. We're developing cases that protect your glasses from breaking. We have branded glasses. We have lanyards that hold your glass. We have lids that keep you from spilling at bottle shares. We have lint-free rags. We have, you know, everything that all you could need, right? And she, she sources all of that and, and so takes care of all that. There's a chance she might actually hear this. There's zero chance that she will hear this. Oh, okay. So yeah, what she do you does, hate most about being married to her? Um, that's actually a good does she question. Have any sisters? And uh, so she does. Which one's hot? Um, she has two sisters, um, and I have known them both since they were small children. Did you date one? No, uh, I did kiss one once on accident. Okay. Yeah. On accident. I did. Yeah. I used to. Me when, too, bro. When I did you? Because yeah. I've met uh, your wife's sister, and which one? There's five. Um. Well, I've met two of them. I kissed all. Ah, uh, look at you, bro. Look at you. Yeah. No, I, uh, I I did accident. I used to, when I hugged them, I would like kiss them on the cheek. And uh, one time uh, her sister attempted to do the same thing at the same time. We both turned, kissed on the lips, turned, walked away, said nothing about it for like 10 years. And then one day it was like, hey, do you remember that time that we like accidentally kissed? I It was hilarious. I did something similar with my, not with a woman, but with my pastor. Okay. Uh, so when I, and it, the exact same story you just told. Uh-huh. So growing up, can they hear you on mic? <laughs> no. Uh, so we, we I, so I used to date a, the preacher's granddaughter. Okay. When I was like 15. And I used to hold court, 
right? Like, I, I, being a fun, energetic guy at 15, I would talk to my friends in the vestibule right outside of the sanctuary of church and, you know, all, all the church words. And he used to do this. He's an older guy. Mm-hmm. And his thing as a pastor would always be to bring you in and touch cheeks. Okay. And then just pull you in and squeeze your face. So we would touch cheeks and we'd, we'd it like a kiss, mm-hmm. but just cheeks. Okay. So I'm talking. Old man, Brother Glass, walks up and uh, he leans in to hug everyone. And I, without even hesitating, just turned, instead of giving him my cheek, mm-hmm. kissed the old man on the mouth. Okay. But everyone saw it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was ridiculed immediately. Okay. Uh, just how fun, how weird it would be. Of course, Chris is going to kiss a man awkward. Like, he's an older guy. Like, he's not really, like, <laughs> trained to handle those things. Right? Mm-hmm. So, it's not like we all laugh about it. It's like, uh, <laughs> you know, the old guy's like, oh, this kid's weird. <laughs> like, right, just, you yeah. Know? But uh, but I think I would have traded that for a sister versus a an older man. Yeah, because it was just a funny like anecdote uh, when it got bro- brought back up. And y'all talked about it years later. Yeah, years later, got brought back up, and it was like ah, that was weird. Um, yeah. Well, so so uh, let, let's pivot a little bit. Let, tell me a little bit about someone say whiskey. Talk to me about what's coming up next. Where people can find you. Uh, where is the Randall train going? Um, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm very focused on growing the podcast. So I'm in a unique position because I'm a realtor and, you know, as a real estate agent, you know, you probably spend 70 to 80% of your time trying to find your next client, right? You're cold calling, you're doing open houses, you're calling past clients, you're doing email marketing campaigns, you're, you know, building online marketing campaigns, whatever it is you're doing. And I have converted a hundred maybe 110% of that time into focusing on the whiskey community. Sure. And what I've discovered is that they buy houses too. They buy houses too. Right. And so I can afford to spend an awful lot of my time. You know, there's certain things that I have to be involved in. um, But, and so I, I'm got a hundred percent of my growth focus on whiskey. And so, you know, I do plan on, you know, doing some travel and things like that for the Prideful Goat when the time comes for that. Um, yeah, but so Bourbon Real Talk, the Prideful Goat, uh, if you need a house in the DFW area, Randall Sullivan. I can help with that, yeah. And then, and, but someone say whiskey as a club has is, is grown, you know, quite a bit. And, you know, that was a difficult uh, to, a beast to tame, you know, because... Oh, we're still taming ours. Yeah. yeah. And I, I feel like we've we've gotten to a place of um, self-sustainability, uh, right? Sure. Because we have enough highly active members that understand our culture that when, you know, somebody who is used to the national bourbon sites where there's just a lot of trolls trying to get, you know, comic counts up by saying something outlandish. Sure. When someone comes in and does that, everybody just goes, hey, we kind of don't do that here. Um, but yeah, so there's, you know, for me, what I, I, I will be traveling more. I'll be making more announcements of, you know, where I'm going to be because I like to get together and meet people face to face and shake hands and have a drink. Uh, there'll be more of that. There'll be barrel picks that we'll do through the, the program. Um, we've, where can Bourbon Real Talk be found? Um, our website, bourbonrealtalk.com. We're biggest on, on YouTube. So YouTube forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. And we're on Facebook as well. Uh, okay. Facebook forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. Well, listen, man, uh, I look forward to the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've got quite a bit planned in the next six months. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, yeah, thanks for coming down from Dallas and making this happen. Absolutely. I'd love to be on any time you'll have me. Of course, man. All right. Cheers. Cheers, bud. Balcony's first ever year-round bourbon was an inspiration. It all had to work together. A blend of carefully selected ingredients, Texas-sized pot stills, and creative people determined to find the absolute best way to usher a new whiskey along. When you discover how it pairs with a meaningful moment, suddenly the feeling of drinking great whiskey becomes a whole lot more.